A cordial welcome to all of you to this fourth Gamini Korea Memorial Lecture. We are pleased to have with us members of the Gamini Korea's family, his friends and colleagues who have worked both with him in Sri Lanka and in Geneva. And uh, uh, all of you who have been what I would call the friends of the Gamini Korea Foundation. Today, uh, we commemorate the life and work of Dr. Correa, who, as you know, had a huge impact on the Sri Lankan economy and played a vital role in international economic affairs. And the best way of summarizing Dr. Correa's career was what the former Prime Minister of India said of him. He said that Dr. Gamini Correa was an outstanding international civil servant and diplomat, a distinguished economist, and above all, a warm and friendly human being. And I think all of you who knew him knows the truth of those words. This being the, this is the fourth Gamini Korea Memorial Lecture. The first memorial lecture was given by Dr. Saman Kalegama, who was a director of the Gamini Korea Foundation. The second lecture was given by Dr. Harsha Atrupana, who is with us here. Um, and the third lecture by Mr. Janta Danapala, a former director of the Gamini Korea Foundation. So today we have Dr. Indrajit Kumari, Kumar Swami, who is also uh, director of the Gamini Korea Foundation. And we are very pleased that he accepted this invitation, considering his extremely busy schedule. Dr. Kumaraswamy was educated at Royal College at Harrow and then in Cambridge University where he obtained his BA in economics and a MA degree. And he subsequently obtained his DPhil from the University of Sussex. An outstanding feature of Dr. Kumar Swami is that he was not only an uh, excellent academic, but also a sportsman. He played rugger for Royal. He captained the Sri Lanka rugger team. He played cricket for three years at Harrow and played for the Cambridge University. So it is very much, he is very much a rounded personality. And being a distinguished Raghurite, I think he's quite capable of tackling the issues in front of him. Dr. Kumaraswamy, joined the Central Bank around 1970, I think. And um, he was in the economics depart uh, department and was also seconded to 
the Ministry of Finance. He played an important role in the Finance Ministry, but he is very humble to describe it as that of carrying the bags of the Finance Minister. He used to always call himself as a bag carrier. And he also told us the story of how once, I think it was in Paris, when he lost his coat to the finance minister. The finance minister grabbed his coat because he had forgotten to bring his coat down. So after his spell in Sri Lanka, he joined the Commonwealth Secretariat and rose to the position of chief economist in international finance, I think. And then on his retirement, he returned here. And I recall that when the country was in quite some turmoil regarding the appointment of a governor to the central bank, uh, and his name was being mentioned, but there was no certainty, I was in Gaul and I read that day's newspaper, which had a very appropriate headline. It said, Here cometh the man. So we are indeed privileged to have him as the governor of the central bank. We are privileged to have him on the board of the Garmini Korea Foundation. And we are privileged to have him here to deliver his lecture. Dr. Indrajit Kumar Swami. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a special privilege to be uh, introduced by one of my old bosses and mentors in, in the Central Bank. And I thank him very much for his generous, well, over generous uh, introduction. And it's also a special honor to be able to deliver this lecture. Uh, as you uh, all are aware, I think I better stand up here. As you are all aware, um, Dr. Correa was really a iconic figure uh, in, in the economics world um, at a time when there was the um, whole movement um, towards a new international economic order. I think uh, you may, I don't know how many of you recall that back in the 70s, um, there were a number of leading thinkers from third world countries who felt that the global economy was structured in a highly inequitable way, that global trade, global uh, capital flows uh, were uh, really geared towards an earlier period uh, marked by colonial relationships and that there hadn't really been a transformation of those structures. And Dr. Correa was very much in the forefront of thinking of how one could overcome some of the negative legacy of, of colonialism as far as economic, international economic relationships were concerned. And I think his time in Angtad um, was dedicated towards thinking afresh as to how one could have a, a more equitable global economy. Now my theme for today is uh, uh, towards a vibrant economy and a prosperous country. Uh, what I'm proposing to do is to initially try to make the case that we are living in the midst of a particularly favorable set of circumstances for the country, possibly the most favorable in over five or six decades, since the late 1950s probably. Having made that case, I then uh, want to talk about three paradigm shifts that we need to take cognizance of if we are to take advantage of these favorable circumstances. Then to move on to um, 
spend some time telling you about various frameworks that the government is putting in place for macroeconomic policy formulation, which are intended to give greater stability and predictability to the whole process of macroeconomic management. After that, um, I want to talk a little bit about the growth model that's embedded in the government's Vision 2025 document and measures that are being taken to strengthen the growth framework and finally to give you a little bit of a flavor about some of the government's major uh, development programs. Uh, when one, in my position, when one gets hold of a captive audience, I'm afraid uh, <laughs> this, is, this is what uh, one gets very tempted to do. So I hope you will bear with me while I go through these uh, themes. So why do I say this? Uh, this is arguably the most favorable set of circumstances for 50, 60 years. If you recall from the late 1950s, Sri Lanka experienced a dramatic and secular decline in its terms of trade. It was essentially a tea rubber coconut economy and over a prolonged period there was a decline in the prices of those commodities. In fact, if you refer to the World Bank's World Development Report of 1972, there is a box on Sri Lanka citing Sri Lanka as a classic case of a country which had been buffeted by severe terms of trade decline. While the country was experiencing this squeezing of the surpluses in the economy, there was a demographic surge. The population grew at 3% and above in the 60s and 70s. So the surpluses were coming down, the number of people was increasing. Clearly that placed a great strain on economic management in that, in that period. And the authorities at that time chose a set of Jiruji's inward-looking policies to contend with this twin squeeze on the economic prospects of the country. Of course, that was very much part of the mainstream at that time. There was a general perception that while colonialism had ended and that political sovereignty had been achieved by the post-colonial countries, that really there was not economic sovereignty. And some of the issues that I mentioned at the outset that Dr. Correa grappled with were very much to the fore. And so the thinking amongst many developing countries was that they should insulate themselves from the vagaries of the international economy. So we constructed barriers and had inward-looking policies. Now, at that time, I don't, can't remember what the population was, but it was probably about 15, 16 million. So if you have a population of 15, 16 million, um, a policy based on domestic demand and inward-looking policies clearly could not sustain, sustain um, prolonged and sustained increases in the quality of life of the people. It was not possible to experience 6, 7, 8% growth that some other countries began to experience from the 1970s onwards particularly in East Asia. So that was another drag on the economic prospects of the country. So you had the terms of trade decline, you had demographic pressure, and then you had a policy response which was not really aligned with the requirements of the Sri Lankan economy. Though as I said, that was very much part of the orthodoxy at that time. Then there was a liberalization of the economy in 1977 and shortly after that, there was a conflict. So Sri Lanka, though it was the second country after Chile to liberalize its economy, it was not able to get the bank for the buck of being an early liberalizer because clearly the conflict um, imposed a very high war risk premium on the economy, which was again a major drag on the development prospects of the country. So now, if you look around, 
we don't really have any such drags holding back our prospects. Not only that, we are located in Asia, the most dynamic region in the world, 20 miles from the, it was the fastest growing large economy until a couple of quarters ago, but fast growing India with the five um, southern states which have been growing at double digits just at our doorstep and we are smack bang in the middle of China's maritime silk route. So a combination of better overall circumstances and the tailwind given by a location, an excellent location, which has actually gained even greater salience, and I will say a little bit more about that later, has meant that this is probably the best shot that we've had in many years, which is why I say this is probably the most favorable set of circumstances the country has um, experienced for many, many years. So what do we need to do to uh, take advantage of these circumstances? And here, as I said, I talked about three paradigm shifts. The first relates to the balance between social development and growth and wealth creation. As you all know, Sri Lanka has been an outperformer when it comes to social development. Our ranking on the UNDP Human Development Index, our performance on the, multi, on the Millennium Development Goals, all that is well above what we'd expect of a country at our stage of development. So it's very fair to ask the question, so why don't we go on as we have done? Because after all, we have provided a good quality of life for our people. Our social indicators are excellent. Uh, why do we need a change? And my answer to that would be, despite all our social development, we've had two youth insurrections in the south and a separatist conflict in the north. Now, the causality for these three episodes is, is, is complex and different in a number of ways, but in my view, arguably the most important explanatory factor is the mismatch between expectations and opportunities for our young people. That, in my view, is the underlying cause for these episodes, both in the north and east of the country, as well as in the south. Of course, there was an overlay of other issues, particularly in the separatist conflict. But the underlying problem is that. So, in my view, that places a, heavy, a, a high premium on pursuing wealth creation side by side with our social development. We need to consolidate and build on our social development, but we need to do better in terms of growing the cake as well. So that is really the challenge. So that's one paradigm shift for us to be focused on, on, on growth uh, and productivity and competitiveness because in a globalized economy, there's a very high premium placed on competitiveness. And that is not something we generally are focused on in the way we should be. There should be a laser-like focus on productivity and competitiveness. Otherwise, in this globalized economy, and despite all the talk of a backlash against globalization, I think for the foreseeable future, we're going to have a globalized economy and we're going to have to be competitive within it. Um, and it becomes even more important that we, uh, we achieve this competitiveness uh, because we have an education, educated population with rapidly increasing aspirations. So unless we're able to meet the aspirations of our people, particularly in terms of material advancement, then some of the issues that have occurred in the past could well recur. Some of the social and political challenges. So we need to get this balance between growth and um, social development uh, somewhat different from what we have had in the past. The second paradigm shift 
that I would like to allude to is the fact that we are now a low middle income country. Um, for many years, we were very much favored uh, by the traditional donors. I see Mrs. Kurupu here, she used to get large amounts of money uh, when she was uh, director, of, uh, director General of External Resources because as I said, we were the second country after Chile to liberalize. We had a pretty liberal polity most of the time. It kind of goes this way and that way, but by and large, it's been a competitive and pluralist polity. So the traditional donors were extremely keen to demonstrate good development outcomes in a country with these characteristics. So we got very generous amounts of aid. And two thirds of that aid, often it was about 5% of GDP, two thirds of that aid came from the concessional windows of the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank. So that was 10 year grace periods, 30, 40 year maturity, less than 1% administration charge. So that's the kind of infusion of foreign savings that we got into the economy. Now, the, the, it, it was a double-edged sword because the downside was that it meant that we didn't take some of the tough decisions that we had to take. It enabled us to live beyond our means and to kind of float along. And every so often we'd get into trouble and we'd get bailed out with concessional money. You know, we'd have an IMF program. We'd take the first tranche, get the money in, and the program was abandoned. I think so far we've only, I think we've had more than 10 programs and we've only completed one. I hope this one, which we're in the midst of, we're able to complete. But, you know, and we were allowed to get away with that. Because as I said, uh, you know, one could classify Sri Lanka as a donor darling. And, and, and uh, it, it got us into bad habits, but it enabled us to kind of float along. Uh, but that has changed. We're now a low middle income country. Our access to concessional money is diminishing and will soon uh, disappear altogether, which has meant that we've had to go to international capital markets to raise the foreign savings that we require to meet our commitments. Now, again, we were very fortunate. I remember David Hopper, who was a white, uh, vice president of the World Bank in the 1980s, saying that he thought that God was a Sri Lankan because somehow, you know, we fall on our feet. And again, we fell on our feet because just as we l were losing access to concessional money because of our graduation to low middle income country status, you get the global financial crisis and the major central banks sloshing liquidity into the system as though there is no tomorrow. And suddenly there was all this money out there looking for yield. And we, of course, gorged on it. We um, borrowed, not in a disciplined way, and, but it again enabled us to kind of float along. You know, we borrowed commercially. Um, uh, and now I will talk about the debt dynamics later, but now, uh, it is a challenge for us, uh, what, what happened. Um, and so, as I, so in a sense, what has happened now is that we have exposure to rating agencies and international capital markets. And if people think that the IMF is tough, capital markets and rating agencies are far more brutal because you can just have a stop in terms of access to those markets. As countries like Greece, a number of Latin American countries have experienced, suddenly you can't borrow uh, at all from these markets. It just freezes if you lose control um, of your macroeconomic fundamentals. So that imposes a much, much higher premium on sound macroeconomic management. Much higher premium than we've ever had before. And that, that premium is enhanced by our debt and deficit dynamics. We have to be even more careful, even more prudent, and make sure that we um, maintain sufficient discipline to ensure that we have access to these markets. Because at the moment, we are borrowing to pay back our earlier debt, and we need to have that access to those markets for a number of years. And we have, we have to have the the, the, the outcomes in terms of macroeconomic fundamentals to be able 
to retain that access and to be able to borrow at a reasonable rate. So that's the second paradigm shift. The third paradigm shift is the fact that, as far as I know, we are pretty much the only country to have experienced a demographic transition before a major economic transformation. So we are confronting the aging problem at a much earlier stage of our development process. And the implications for that are that we can no longer drive growth through labor augmentation. You can't ha have increasing numbers of people joining the workforce and adding to the growth process. Instead, we now have to work much harder because we have to drive it through increased productivity. So we're having to drive growth to a far greater extent through productivity increases than almost any other country at an earlier stage in our development process. So that is another, another uh, uh, um, feature uh, of our development experience that in, in many ways is unique. So the implications of that are that, again, like if I may reiterate, the need for this focus on productivity and competitiveness. If you look back, there has been a toxic combination of populist policies and a deeply entrenched entitlement culture amongst our people, which have fed off each other. And there's been a kind of negative uh, feedback loop which has dragged this country down. We were second to Japan on almost any indicator at the time of independence. We were ahead of South Korea in the 60s, not far behind Singapore. Well, we've fallen well back, and there aren't very many countries behind us in Asia now. So part of it has been this mix of, as I said, populist policies and, and a, a deeply entrenched entitlement culture. So that is something, again, we need to break, and we need to be much more focused on. I keep coming back. It has to be productivity. It has to be innovation. It has to be competitiveness. These things have to get embedded in our DNA. In the same way, for many years now, entitlement has been embedded in our DNA. So we need to make that transition. So those are the three uh, paradigm shifts that I was speaking about. Uh, let me now uh, talk a little bit about the new growth model. Um, as you know, uh, at the end of the conflict, uh, in the years after the conflict, <coughs> growth was driven largely by infrastructure uh, development, investment in infrastructure, much of which was financed by foreign commercial borrowing. Um, so you had sectors like transport, like construction, transport, uh, etc., which drove the growth process. Those were essentially non-tradable sectors, and I will talk a little bit more about why that was a problem. But anyway, that growth model has now run out of headroom simply because we do not have the headroom to drive the development process through, uh, uh, through uh, foreign commercial borrowing. So it's got to be something else. So what does it have to be? A, it has to be private sector driven. Again, this is not an ideological position um, because you get very good development outcomes with different mixes of the state and the private sector. You have China and Vietnam at one end and more market-oriented economies at the other. But in our case, we don't have a choice simply because of our fiscal situation and our debt dynamics. The state simply cannot be the driver of the development process. There isn't the fiscal space to do it. So it is a purely pragmatic um, position to take to say that our growth has to be driven by the private sector. Secondly, this private sector driven growth needs to have two pillars. One is exports and the other is investment 
including FDI. Why exports? Uh, again, as I said before, with a market of 21 million people now, per capita income of about 3,800 US dollars, you can't drive 6, 7% growth that we require to meet the aspirations of our people through just selling into this domestic market. In fact, arguably the biggest indictment of the policy framework that existed in this country over the last 10, 12 years is the fact that it led to the tradable goods sector, that's imports and exports at the percent of GDP, declining from about 80% to 45%. And for our exports to decline from a peak of 33% to 12.7%. Now that in itself is a major, major drawback but if you compound that by borrowing commercially, as though there is no tomorrow, it is a suicidal path, uh, which is what we embarked upon. So we allowed our exports to come down and we borrowed. At the same time, we borrowed abroad commercially. Uh, so that, that is the, the challenge that now has to be managed, that we have to unravel uh, that, that problem. So we have to have exports. We have to have exports to drive the growth process. We have to have exports to create jobs. We have to have exports to pay back our debt. So that is, has, it has a sine qua non, and I think that is embedded very much in the government's 2025 document. <coughs> Why FDI? I mean, I think all of you know the role of FDI. Um, and you know it fills the savings investment gap, you get your technology, know-how, access to markets. And if you look around the successful countries of East and Southeast Asia, one needs to leave Japan and Korea out because they, they actually did not have rely so much on FDI. But from that time onwards, whether a country was as large as China or as small as Singapore, FDI has played a key role in the export transformation that has provided these countries with sustained growth and development, with sustained poverty reduction, and sustained high levels of employment. So, so that's essentially the growth model. You have uh, uh, private sector driven, uh, exports and, and investment, with uh, with the uh, with FDI playing an important role. Now it's perfectly legitimate to ask the question at a time when there has been now for almost a decade muted growth in the world economy and sluggish international trade and the specter of protectionism in the in the developed world, particularly in in the US and, uh, and Europe, whether this outward looking strategy of exports, FDI, et cetera, makes sense. And there, I would go back to what I said at the early, uh, so what I said earlier, in that we have some advantages that trumps the headwinds in the world economy. Though the world economy actually is doing better than it has done for some time at the moment. We can counter those headwinds by, as I said, our location. This proximity to India, the, the, the being at the center of the Chinese maritime silk route, um, and also the dynamics of geopolitics in the Indian Ocean at the moment, which we can leverage to our advantage. Everybody has taken a keen interest in Sri Lanka, the major powers, the Americans, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Indians, of course, as always. So we need to really um, box clever is, is, a, is an American adage, I think, to take advantage of this particular conjuncture. So as I said, the combination of location and the excellent international relations that we have with the capital surplus countries in 
um, East and Southeast Asia, and with our traditional markets in the US and Europe, means that we should be able to overcome any headwinds there are in the global economy. Okay, so I've talked about the growth model. What is being done to strengthen the growth framework? Here, there are a number of measures that are being taken to improve the investment climate, to improve investment promotion, to improve trade facilitation, and uh, to basically use trade policy to our advantage. So let me take each of those in turn. The investment climate, of course, you would say not much is happening. We have gone backwards. Uh, in the latest uh, World Bank's Doing Business Index saw us go from 110 to 111. Uh, not a distinguished performance. However, that ranking was as of the 1st of June, 2017. In mid the middle of May this year, the government launched a series of action plans to improve the investment climate. There were eight task forces established on, on eight of the 10 pillars of the World Bank's Doing Business Index. And those task forces set out to deregulate. If there were six or seven steps to reduce it to three or four. Um, if technology could facilitate things, to infuse technology. And now those action plans, these task forces, each of them have got an action plan. And that action plan was launched in the middle of May. A little bit too late to influence the ranking that just came out. But it'd be very disappointing if by next year we do not see a material improvement. In fact, Ajit Gunawardno, you know, the deputy deputy chairman of JKH is now playing a leading role in driving driving that program uh, in, in terms of implementing these action plans. So there is a concerted effort to improve the investment climate. On investment promotion, uh, Professor Ricardo Hausman of the Center for International Development at Harvard he and his, and his team have been working very closely with the Board of Investment. In the past, the Board of Investment just focused, was a rather passive role where they looked to facilitate anybody who was willing to come. Now, they are looking to be much more proactive. The idea is to identify subsectors where Sri Lanka can have a comparative advantage. Professor Hausman has this a schema whereby he, he, he talks of monkeys going through the jungle whereby they jump from one tree to the other each time to a higher branch to get to the top of the jungle. So similarly, we need to jump from our current rather basic export basket to more complex and diversified products which give us a an export basket that has greater value addition and, and is more complex and has enhanced technology and creates more value and higher higher value jobs. So they've identified some subsectors and within those subsectors they are targeting anchor investors. Now Samsung accounted for 40 percent of Vietnam's uh, exports at one stage. And I think Intel accounted for 75% of Costa Rica's. So the message there is that if you're able to attract four or five anchor investors of that nature, you can transform your export performance. In fact, just this afternoon, I heard that we are very close to getting a billion dollar investment from China on, on tires. Uh, so that, that's the kind of a, a state-of-the-art factory. Uh, so that's the kind of uh, investment we need to, need to attract and we need to build on what is still a very a relatively modest start. So that's investment promotion. On trade facilitation, Sri Lanka is a signatory to the 
WTOs, um, uh, trade facilitation agreement. I think it's pretty much the only agreement that has come out of the Doha round. Uh, and they the National Trade Facilitation Committee, which is again working away at trying to reduce the costs of the co cross-border movement of goods and services. And the, and, the, and the centerpiece of those reforms is the single electronic window, whereby a number of government institutions would be hooked into the customs electronically, and people will no longer have to uh, go into the customs uh, clearing yards and you know have all the issues and challenges uh, that they've faced in the past. So we're not too far away from getting this single electronic window, which a number of other countries already have. But the most interesting narrative relates to trade policy. So there are different components to the country's trade policy at the moment. One is there is an anti-dumping bill in parliament. Clearly, if there is going to be any liberalization uh, of trade policy, one needs to be able to ensure that domestic producers are able to compete on a level playing field. So this anti-dumping legislation is a crucial part of trade policy reform. Secondly, the government with the assistance of the World Bank and the International Trade Center in Geneva and funded by the EU is working on a trade adjustment package. The idea there is to try to identify the sectors which are likely to be affected adversely by trade liberalization and then help them to become more competitive. And at the same time, to provide retraining for workers from these affected industries. So there's a trade adjustment package. And all this is within, I should have mentioned at the beginning, there is a national trade policy framework, which is only about a 20-page document. It's actually uh, very well constructed and sets out exactly what the government's trade policy is. Um, now, really, the, the most interesting part of the narrative on, on the trade area are clearly these um, partnership agreements that we are negotiating. Now, we have a bilateral free trade agreement with India, as you know, which has not worked as well as it could have done, but it certainly has been better than widely perceived. Because a lot of people say we've had this bilateral agreement and all that has happened is that our uh, trade deficit with India has ballooned. Actually, one has to be a little bit more nuanced than that. Because what you have in terms of assessing the trade agreement, FTA, you have to assess what has happened in terms of the trade that has taken place under the FTA. That is the trade that has taken place on a preferential basis. And when you look at that, in most years, 70-80% of Sri Lanka's exports to India go on a preferential basis. And, at, at, and it's exactly the other way around. Only about 20% of India's exports to Sri Lanka come on a preferential basis. There is a very large trade deficit simply because India is the most competitive supplier of a number of goods that Sri Lanka requires. So if we, if we didn't, you know, if we say, okay, if we didn't uh, import from India, we would have to import from another source, which was more expensive. So while our trade deficit with India may be smaller, our overall trade deficit would actually be larger. So, I, you know, that one has to look at it in a nuanced way. I'm not saying that the bilateral FTA has worked well. It has not worked as well as it should have done, but it's certainly not as bad as it is often made out to be. So now the government is looking to make the existing FTA work better through what they're calling an early harvest. They want to tackle some of the problems that exist in terms of non-tariff barriers, um, in terms of some of the quotas that restrict the um, exports, some key exports from Sri Lanka to India. So those are being addressed as an early harvest. And then to deepen and widen the agreement by reducing India's negative list, and we would have to do a little bit as well, but we, 
expect the Indians to do more and to widen the agreement to in include services, um, investment, training and technology. And a similar agreement is being negotiated with China and Singapore. Now it's quite natural when you are a relatively small country uh, to be um, rather queasy about negotiating bilateral trade deals with much, much larger countries. But there is a well-trodden path in terms of the parameters within which such agreements should be negotiated. On the one hand, you need the, uh, the um, agreements to be based on the principles of non-reciprocity and special and differential treatment. And here, both India and China recognize that principle. In layman's term, that means they will do much more than we will. Their negative lists on goods will be much shorter than ours. Their positive lists on services will be much longer than ours. The, the phase-in period in terms of when liberalization kicks in will be much longer for us than them. And there, there are, of course, safeguard provisions. If there are import surges, then we would be able to trigger tariffs if we build in these safeguards. And of course, we need a robust dispute resolution mechanism. So there are these parameters within which these agreements can be negotiated, which enable a small country to benefit. So if we are able to successfully um, widen and deepen the Indian agreement and sign agreements with China and Singapore, Sri Lanka can be in a truly unique position. To the best of my knowledge, there is no country in the world that has preferential access to China, India, and Europe, because of course we have the restoration of GSP+. No other country. So that is a market of over 3 billion people. There are over 190 countries which are chasing uh, foreign direct investment in this world. But nobody can say that we have preferential access to China, India, and Europe. Come and locate in Sri Lanka and sell on a preferential basis to those three enormous markets. So that actually is a key differentiator if we are able to complete these negotiations successfully. So not, so not only will it really boost our own exporters, but the real prize, as I was saying, is to leverage the trade investment nexus to show those markets and attract investment in here. So that is really the trade policy story. So these are various uh, ways in which uh, the, um, the growth framework is being strengthened. Uh, before I get on to the government's uh, development programs, let me go back to what is the bread and butter of the central bank. And that is to talk about the frameworks that are being put in place to strengthen macroeconomic policy making. As you all know, over the years, the fiscal deficit has been the main source of instability in the system. It has pumped excess demand into the system. It's meant that Sri Lanka could be characterized for much of the post-77 era as a high budget deficit, high inflation, high nominal interest rate, overvalued exchange rate country. That is diametrically the opposite of how one would caricaturize the successful countries of East and Southeast Asia, which had robust budgetary outcomes, low inflation, low nominal interest rates, and uh, an undervalued and competitive exchange rate. That was the key to their success, though that macroeconomic framework. So what the first thing we need to do clearly is to make sure that our fiscal house is put in order. Not just in terms of, as I said, driving growth and employment, but also to manage our debt. So the government has, as you know, embarked upon a revenue enhancement based fiscal consolidation program. And to its credit, there have been two major achievements. One was the increase in the VAT uh, rate from 11 to 
and the elimination of some exemptions. And now we have the Indian Revenue Act, which in my, in my view um, has uh, provides a simpler uh, 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 tax structure and a wider base. So those are key achievements uh, on the revenue side. In addition, measures are being taken to improve tax administration. Technology, the Revenue Administration Management Information System is now pretty much up and running. Uh, and the, there is going to be a systematic effort to improve tax administration and tax compliance. So uh, it's too early to say whether we have, we've uh, turned the corner, but a pretty reasonable beginning has been made in terms of this revenue enhancement based fiscal consolidation program. Then as far as monetary policy is concerned, um, the central bank is transitioning to a flexible inflation targeting framework. In the past, we've targeted monetary aggregates. Now we are going to target um, inflation, um, and the target is going to be 4 to 6%, really a range of 4 to 6%. And that requires building up a modeling and forecasting capacity. Uh, it, build, it requires a legal and uh, framework, an accountability framework to embed um, this process, this fle flexible inflation targeting process. And as my senior colleague, Dr. Kolomege, pointed out, if the central bank embarks upon flexible inflation targeting without the finance ministry behaving itself, then it's going to be a, a serious, serious problem. And there, we are working very hard to get the government, and it seems the government is moving in that direction, for the government to introduce some fiscal rules. Uh, that is to essentially, countries like New, Ze New Zealand was a pioneer, 20 odd countries have done it, whereby, now we already have a Fiscal Responsibility Management Act, which has a target for the fiscal deficit and a target for debt to GDP. But nobody, it has no teeth and nobody has abided by it. it has, so what we want to do now is to try and give it some teeth and to specify particular reasons when you can exceed the targets. It could be natural disaster, it could be an exogenous shock, it could be severe recession, but there has to be specific reasons why the target is, is exceeded. And when you exceed the target, you must set out how we are going to come back within the target, have a plan to come back. So that is the kind of framework we're trying to convince the government to put into place to complement the flexible inflation targeting regime. Because flexible inflation targeting, we hope, will be a much more forward-looking and proactive way of setting monetary policy, setting interest rates. Because in the past, we have tended to do a, a little bit too late. Uh, little, do too little too late. Uh, so that's, those are the frameworks for the fiscal uh, policy and for monetary policy. And on the exchange rate, Historically, we have tried, we have had a dirty float, as they call it, which is that we have tried to defend a fixed rate uh, using our reserves. It is just simply not possible. Time and again, we found that. We deplete our scarce resource, uh, reserves. At the moment, much of it is borrowed. So to use your borrowed reserves to defend the currency is a complete no-brainer. So we simply have to have a more flexible exchange rate policy, but for that to work, the budget has to work well, and it shouldn't pump excess demand into the system and suck imports in and put pressure on the balance of payments and therefore on the currency. Monetary policy must not be too loose. Again, by if it does that, there'll be excess demand, sucking in imports, pressure on the balance of payments, pressure on the currency. So everything has to fit in. You've got to have a prudent fiscal policy, a prudent monetary policy, if you have that, then there is less pressure on the exchange rate and you can manage a competitive and fairly stable exchange rate. Right now, we're in a little bit of a sweet spot. I hope elections don't come and spoil everything, but at the moment, we've, we've, <laughs> we are in a reasonable sweet spot. Um, then, 
the other framework I'd like to talk to you about is liability management. As I told you, this, um, this framework which gave us a sharp decline in our exports and a rapid increase in our external borrowing, particularly commercial borrowing, which have gone up from 2% of GDP to 13% of GDP in about uh, eight, nine years, um, has meant that we have a very, very serious uh, debt dynamics to manage. So let me separate domestic debt from external debt. On domestic debt, we have a very high peak in terms of debt servicing next year. But fortuitously, and again, this is Hopper's story about God being Sri Lankan, fortuitously, there were no, there have, there are no debt maturities in the last five months of this year. So that is enabling us to collect some money. We are still having monthly bond auctions and we are collecting money. We hope to collect about 100 billion rupees, which will enable us to manage the peak in domestic debt next year. So hopefully, provided the government maintains fiscal discipline and doesn't go on a borrowing spree next year, we think we can just about manage the domestic debt the repayments next year. On the external debt front, we have a bunching of external debt payments whereby you know, we've taken a series of international sovereign bonds of between 500 million and 1.5 billion. So there is a sovereign bond which becomes due every year, in some years, two of them, from 2019 onwards, 2019 to 2021, then there is a break for 22, 23, and then again from 24 through to 27. So there is this, this bunching which has to be managed. And for that, we, the government is introducing, the finance ministry is introducing, a Liability Management Act. Now, why that is necessary is because the current appropriation law only allows the government to borrow the money that is needed to fund that particular year's deficit. That is, the borrowing requirement for any given year in the government budget is the ceiling. You can't borrow beyond that. Now, of course, if the only borrowing you can do is to, to finance government expenditure, you can't collect money for liability management. So what we're doing is to now, uh, the, the, the Liability Management Act will now give flexibility for the government to borrow beyond its borrowing requirement for any given year, but for a specific purpose. And there is a cap, etc. So we're not kind of opening the floodgates because there's a particular reason why there was this discipline of the government only being allowed to borrow its, its, its uh, requirement for any, any given year so that people didn't go on a borrowing spree. But now we're trying to relax that because we have this problem of liability management, which we have to collect money for. So we're going to use the space that the new Liability Management Act will provide to go to the market. Again, we are fortunate because in 2018, there is no sovereign bond maturity. So we have a bit of space. So during the course of next year, the plan is to raise some money which will help us to manage the repayments which are bunched through from 2019 onwards. So we will do some switching, some buybacks of a whole range of options that the bankers have and we will clearly try to choose the best possible uh, option to manage uh, these liabilities. But, you know, that is, this liability management is really buying time. You know, it's not resolving the problem. You can only resolve the problem if you boost exports and earn more money. We are essentially, this liability management exercise is to, to increase the tenor, reduce costs, and push, push the liabilities out further so that we have the breathing space to get this export transformation going. So we can't get away from that. So we need fiscal discipline to continue so that there is no more debt is not added on, unsustainable debt. And we need the liability management to buy time. But in the end, we have to earn more money through exports of goods and services. So those are kind of the frameworks that are being put in place in terms of macroeconomic management. So as I said, favorable circumstances, a new growth model, 
measures to strengthen the growth framework and frameworks to have more prudent macroeconomic policy making, more prudent, more stable, and more predictable macroeconomic policy making. Finally, let me give you a quick flavor of what, um, what the government's development program entails. Um, if one starts, say, in candy, uh, the, the Japanese are formulating a master plan for the development of candy. It will have a, a religio-cultural component as far as tourism is concerned, and there'll be an industrial zone. Then you come down the Colombo Candy Highway, or maybe the railway, which some people seem to think the railway is better, but whatever it is, you come down there, uh, and there will be industrial zones in Kurunagala and Kuliapitya. Then you come down to the west, and there is a Western Region Megapolis plan. I think all of you know about that. Then you have the Port City Project. Uh, then you go further south. The Athai um, um, enterprise is developing an industrial zone in Kalutara. Uh, then Charlemont in, in, in Gaul is another industrial zone. Then you go down, of course, to Hammanthota. Now I'd like to take a little bit of time to talk about Hammanthota because I felt that the discourse on Hammanthota has not been framed quite as well as it could have been. Because Hammanthota is not just a long lease of the port. It's much more than that. Because the long lease triggers so much more. So clearly the country had to negotiate the best possible deal in terms of the long lease to China merchant. And also that billion dollars is very helpful. It's non-debt creating. It's for a built asset so that it comes and sits on our reserves and it will help with liability management to paying our external debt. In fact, I should have mentioned the government has taken a decision that the proceeds of divestitures, of the sale of public assets, will be earmarked only for liability management. So there will be a foreign currency account, so the Hambantota money or any other foreign money mobilized through the sale of divestitures will be put into that account for managing foreign debt. Rupees mobilized through divestitures will be put into a rupee account to help with managing the domestic debt. So that clearly again gives us a bit of room to maneuver if the government is able to go ahead with this diversity program. I think it hopes to divest the Hyatt and the Hilton in the next few months, but that's been going on for some time. I hope it gets done. Um, so, uh, the, so to get back to the Hammantara story, the, the, the long lease, okay, it's a port deal and it's an asset which wasn't working and the Chinese are quite are very capable of making it work. That's one. Then in the first phase, they will build what are known as five foundational industries. That is an LNG plant, a refinery, a steel plant, a steel billet plant, and a ship repair facility. Those are five investments they will take place. And they call it foundational industries because that will produce the material necessary to build out the industrial zone. I mean, they've asked for 15,000 acres. I don't know whether we can find that much. But even if they do half of that, uh, clearly that will be a, a big development. And why I feel that this whole debate has not been framed well is, you know, 69 years after independence, almost 70, we have done remarkably little for the people of, of, of Monragala, of Uva. The people of Hamanto to have some assets, but they don't work for them. And this, this long lease of the port catalyzes a massive development program for this area of the country, which has been left behind. It is very much a lagging region in the country. And this is an opportunity for us to do something about it. We have not been able to do anything about it for 70 years. He has an opportunity to do something. So I, can, I just simply could not understand what, <laughs> what all the fuss was about this Hammanthota poor deal when we, uh, there is so much we can do for a part of the country, which was, after all, the heartland of two JVP insurrections. So we need to have a bigger, bigger picture in our mind and not become too parochial in the way we assess some of these things. Then we go further up um, the eastern coast, Trincomalee. Subana Jurong, the firm that uh, did the master plan for the Western Region Megapolis, uh, is doing a master plan for Trincomalee. And the idea is that, that uh, Japan, 
India and Singapore would work together to have a big development in that area. So in the same way the Hammantoto development will benefit Monragala, Uva, etc. The idea is that the Trincomalee development will sweep across and benefit the uh, Rajarata area as well. And finally, for the conflict affected areas, um, Kankasanthur Airport and Palali Airport are being uh, rehabilitated and there are plans to improve railway and uh, road connectivity in that whole northern uh, province area, uh, linking it, linking up Trincomalee, Mana, Jaffna, etc. Um, so, and as part of the new Inland Revenue Act, there has been a rationalization of incentives for investment. Tax holidays have gone, and the government now will be giving investment allowances. So, you get a hundred percent investment allowance if you invest in the rest of the country. You get 200% investment allowance if you invest in the conflict affected areas. So with a 200% investment allowance and the existing 100% depreciation over five years, you can actually write off 300% of your investment against tax. So those that's so 200% in the rest of the country, 300% in the conflict affected areas. So those are some of the uh, things that are being done. In addition, I, I see my friend Ahilan here who has managed to uh, motivate the central bank to do something about the, the, the debt distress uh, that is there. In uh, There was a horrible story which came out a week or so ago. So the central bank working with the finance ministry is putting together a package which you will see in the budget. And the idea is to have a pilot program for the north and the north central province. And debt distress is actually an island-wide problem. And if we can get that model working well, the idea is to roll it out for the rest of the country. It's to target it to the really debt distressed families. Uh, first in the northern province and the NCP and then in the rest of the country. So those are some of the things that are going on. Now, you know, it, this sounds very impressive, uh, but one, two things I want to say before I finish. One is these mega development programs are not really going to gain traction for 18 months, two years, maybe more. So in the next 12, 18 months, the, it's the domestic private sector the domestic private sector is cash rich. So far they've been very cautious with reason probably, but now they need to assess whether the macro situation is becoming more stable. Does the government have a decent plan? Is the investment climate improving? Is the cost of doing uh, trading coming down? Ask these hard questions and if they think there's movement in the right direction, I think this is the time that their sentiments must change from wait and see to opening up their wallets and investing. Because it's, it's, the, it's the activating the animal spirits of the domestic private sector is the government's first challenge. If they're able to do that, we will see a pickup in the next 12, 18 months, and then these large development programs can kick in further down the line. Now, will this all work? Uh, and people ask me, you know, what are your priorities? And I keep saying it's implementation, implementation, and implementation. That is the big question mark. Will we get our act together and implement? It's too early to tell. If we can get it right, I think this is a transformative opportunity for the country. Thank you. <laughs>